Well, my name is Jeff DeGrange, and I'm with uh, the Boeing Aircraft Company. I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, in which is the home of the military aircraft systems. I'm in a research and development organization. Um, the function that I lead within the Boeing Company is the identification of commercial off-the-shelf technologies and bring those inside to the Boeing Company and find a way to apply those to our products. Uh, our products are both commercial, uh, our commercial aircraft, military aircraft, satellites, space, and space vehicles. Um, what we do is we'll bring in a number of different um, what we call direct digital manufacturing technologies. And those direct digital manufacturing technologies really start off with some of the metrologies out there. We have uh, a number of platforms within Boeing that are, are non-CAD design. And so uh, in order to enable uh, the use of a digital manufacturing environment, we have to, in many cases, bring it into the CAD world. And so we use a number of laser trackers, contact, non-contact, types of metrologies in order to uh, create the CAD files. Now once we have the CAD data, we then um, um, use that data and send it to various additive manufacturing technologies for the plastic materials as well as the metal materials. Um, and then once we have uh, produced the actual tools or parts, then we also look at um, how do you assemble these parts in the most efficient manner using that uh, computer data? And we also develop and mature and characterize uh, laser projection technologies that project uh, the patterns of where the parts need to be placed, what the part numbers are, where holes need to be drilled, et cetera. Uh, within Boeing, the technologies are used on a number of fronts. I mean, we first start off using the stereolithography, the selective laser centering, the fused deposition modeling technologies, as well as the direct metal fabrication technologies for product development. Um, whether it be uh, a new different product line that we actually want to pull it out of the 3D world and bring it into the physical world, we'll apply those technologies to do that. Um, we also use it to develop actual sections of the airplane and put it in our wind tunnels for wind tunnel testing. Um, if we actually want to validate that an engineering design is absolutely right, we'll, we'll grow it in for form, fit, and function types of applications and, and put it in its actual environment. Um, so product development is one big area. Uh, rapid tooling is another area that in many cases, uh, at least within aerospace, we're very low volume producers. And well, we have uh, quite a, a vast number of technologies within Boeing. We have um, stereolithography, we have electron beam melting, uh, the RCAM process, we have uh, the EOS technologies, both uh, metal and, and, and plastics, we have uh, the LOM landman object manufacturing technology, we have 3D printing, um, Z-Corp, um, the actual wax printing systems, um, we have selective laser centering uh, from 3D as well as EOS, and um, those are the ones that, and then obviously uh, fused deposition modeling, we have quite a bit of uh, FDM capability within Boeing as well. For the past six years, Boeing's been using laser-centered parts for what we consider subsystems components. Uh, those could be environmental control ducts that operate um, under pressure in uh, very cold environments and hot environments, um, or hotter environments. Um, we've done some electrical subsystems components, uh, various types of protective shrouds, and some, some fuel systems components. All of these application types within Boeing is what we consider to be tertiary structure. It's not load-bearing structure. And uh, so there's, a, there's many other opportunities within the subsystems areas on airplanes or within various types of products that uh, we can continue to transition the technology to. Once we start looking at secondary structure or primary structure that you have load and you have various types of uh, mechanical properties that you have to meet. Um, it's much more stringent to take the technology and, and carry it forward uh, uh, for flight hardware. Uh, some of the business drivers, I think that um, number one is you have tremendous unconstrained design capabilities here. So you could really come up with some pretty integrated um, uh, uh, 
structural designs and uh, be, be able to unitize structure to reduce part count and inventories. Uh, the ability to, to actually do engineering change orders uh, very quickly and release that into a, your supply chain, worldwide supply chain, and be able to take new designs and bring them to life uh, in a fraction of time that you would have to be involved with conventional processes is, is a, going to be a very strong business driver. And probably lastly, in my opinion, is um, the whole dynamic supply chain dynamic change as far as the overall life cycle support of the product. I mean, obviously we build airplanes and those airplanes are in service for over 30 years and if you need spare parts 30 years from now, you're going to be building that spare part from a computer file. And um, versus having hard tooling and having to find that hard tool and send it to your supplier and on down the list. So I think from, from a uh, supply chain log logistics standpoint, that's a very, that, that's a very powerful um, business reason to why you'd want to move to direct manufacturing. There's a number of limitations from, from a Boeing perspective. Uh, first of all, the, the producers of the equipment today, um, the equipment is sometimes uh, unreliable and unpredictable. We need to have uh, repeatable, predictable results from the process. And there's some improvements that's going to have to be made with the control systems on the equipment and really to take it to that next level. So that's, that's one of the areas. The second area is materials. We have to uh, really do a better job of defining and setting some standards for uh, materials and characterizing those materials so that we can move into looking at secondary structure and primary structure. And then from an aerospace perspective, uh, the scale up of some of the technologies is going to be pretty important to have machines that uh, can produce larger parts than is currently available today. You know, I would think that in 10 years time that uh, you'll probably see low volume or long life uh, long life product suppliers uh, really moving to this type of technology uh, in the sense that I really see a, a big movement in the next 10 years to some of the metals. I see a potential uh, movement to some of the higher temperature thermoplastic, uh, more uh, higher performing uh, polymer based systems. Uh, for people that are in low volume manufacturing. I absolutely see it being a must in maintaining a competitive ad advantage in an industrial nation. You have a commercial aircraft that's, that's setting at Heath Heathrow Airport. It's waiting on a part. And that airplane's not generating revenue for the airlines. And if that part has to be flown in from a depot someplace or br brought there, where if you actually had a maintenance depot there and if it happened to be a part that you could actually pull out of a digital library, build it on demand in a matter of hours or minutes possibly, um, and take it to the point of usage, I mean that changes the whole dynamics of uh, supporting the existing fleet. Now the challenge that really resides there is what we call the um, um, supersedence issues of how do you take a new material and process and show that it's equal to or better than the current process that you have out there, even though you can do it cheaper and a lot faster, is that we're going to have to look at some of those, um, those um, um, common specifications and substitution practices and address that in our industry before that will be really become mainstream. But if we can work on addressing some of those issues, um, very much as technology would be a staple in the support of whether it be airplanes or trains or any long life product.